Hey guys, this episode is brought to you by WWE 2K16, the video game. Get in the ring and raise some hell with Stone Cold Steve Austin in the largest roster in WWE video game history. WWE 2K16 releases on October 27th on PS4, PS3, Xbox One, and Xbox 360 platforms. Grab your copy, but for now, enjoy the show. This is the Art of Wrestling with professional wrestler Colt Cabana. All right, how you guys doing? Come on in, sit down, let's get this done. You're about to listen to The Art of Wrestling, a professional wrestling podcast. It's a life podcast, it's personal journal, it's an entryway into the minds and souls, the hearts and lives of the people involved in the world of professional wrestling. I'm your host, my name is Cole Cabana. I am jet lagged, I'm also tired from riding on a bus. I'm a bus rider, I'm a bike rider, I'm a bus rider. Most importantly though, I am a professional wrestler. And I am not sitting here live in the studio apartment in Chicago, Illinois. I am in a hotel in Okayama. I'm in a hotel in Okayama, Japan, fresh off a 10-hour bus ride, only to head on over to Fukuoka tomorrow on another five-hour bus ride, traveling on the roads of Japan. Before we go any further, it's fan sport and listener supported podcast supported by people just like you. Give it to you free of charge every single Thursday on coldcommander.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, wherever you get your podcasts from. A couple great ways to support, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. Tell a friend, let somebody know. Tweet out to them, Facebook out, Instagram a picture of you listening to this podcast. Or if you got a couple of bucks in your pocket, head on over to coldmerch.com, digitalcold.com, t-shirts, buttons, pictures, posters, DVDs, digital downloads, premium podcast, great way to support coldmerch.com, digitalcold.com. Yeah, I am in a Japanese hotel right now. I have feng shuied, I have origamied the most beautiful looking podcast. I'm, you know, I'm going to take a picture of it and put it on the Facebook page because this This is some, again, Borash would be proud, but this is even weirder. But I'm getting it done. I'm pretty sure I am so loud right now. Every single person on the Noah crew is very upset with me, although it's not too late, but I'm sure they all want to go to sleep. Nine o'clock over here, nine o'clock on a Wednesday night, which would make that Wednesday morning for you guys when I'm recording. Who knows when this is going to go out because who knows when next time I'm going to find Wi-Fi. Who knows how I'm going to publish it, but I will. It'll get out there. I've made that promise to everybody for uh, over five years now so it'll get done no matter where we are in the world bob holly's on the show today i spent a week with him in cardiff we'll go over all of this how uh, i became friends with bob holly how the world's become friends with bob holly how after having one of the worst reputations in professional wrestling he now all of a sudden has uh, made amends or started to make amends Or started to change his reputation. You know, when we finished doing the live one in Cardiff, he told me how he wanted to come on. And all of a sudden, we start having this great conversation. And I feel like in the start of this conversation, he almost backed off the idea that he was kind of mean. Or at least mean-spirited. But, you know, what he wants to say on the record. I mean, he's very truthful. He's very honest. and And he puts it all out there. So the first uh, the first ten minutes I feel is me trying to get that out of him, which I don't know. I, you be the judge. You 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 see what you see out of it. And then like the back end of it, it was just amazing. A great talk, and I think we talk about how uh, there's so much more to get into with him. I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed Bob Holly on the show again. I, you know, I get into this beginning like I don't. He, this this show wasn't meant for Bob Holly, but. I don't know, as the years have gone by, maybe as I've matured also, you know, as I've matured and realized my position in wrestling, who I am, what I'm doing, uh, you know, who I become friends with, for what reasons, you know, uh, that's uh, how this works, I guess, which is um, which is great, which is great. You know, I, I was more than happy to invite him on and have him on the show, and, and he was really fun. So uh, enjoy this week. I'm enjoying this week. I'm in Japan. I don't think I'm going to make this too long. Landed in Japan, very jet lag, had three shows in the Tokyo area, then two days off, and then here I come on my trip. Today is really the first long, long travel day. I am in the Global League Tournament. It's basically the heavyweight tournament. For those of you who were fans of the Rocky Romero podcast that I did with him, you remember him talking about a guy who had been in New Japan for years, and then all of a sudden Gato gave him this gimmick where he put on an iron fist, and all of a sudden he uh, he changed, he totally reinvented himself, and people started getting interested in him. That was Izuka. I wrestled him, and he's basically Japanese George the Animal Steel. He was one of the matches I had, amongst a couple others. Somebody asked me on Twitter, Colt, when are you going to write your book? 
you know, that, that would be fun. That would, that would be my autobiography. But I said, this is my book. These, these are my recaps. For the ones listening for five years, you've heard the stories every single week of my travels and where I'm at. You know, it's, it's, it's weird. It's odd. If I'm, I'm in Russia, I'm in Sweden, and here I am now in Japan traveling around. I get to meet some of the greatest wrestlers, people that I'm influenced by, not just in Chicago, not just in the Midwest or the East Coast, all around the world. And I have a weird style of wrestling. It's a comedy style of wrestling. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to stick out and I wanted to be different. And then I really, really dissected and tried to learn different aspects, not just of wrestling, not just of comedy, but comedy wrestling, which is a whole different beast. And over my years, I found that there's only two other people in my mind that are like-minded like me and are also naturally just hilarious people. Because wrestling is another thing, but you have to have like a really good sense of humor. I think it's important in order to really, really understand and dissect comedy wrestling. And that's why I announced it on the Twitter, but December 4th, December 5th, and December 6th, I have shelled out my own money and I have bought a ticket for Kikutaro, who comes from Japan, and Grado, who comes from Scotland. There is no GoFundMe here, you know, there is no Kickstarter. That's not what it's about. I'm making this happen because I wanted to make it happen, and I'm excited about it. I'm bringing them over, Wrestling Road Diaries 3, funny equals money, and uh, this one's going to be different because I think we're really going to dissect the idea of comedy wrestling in a docu-style. So the first two were obviously about on the road, and we kind of break down wrestling a little bit, but this is uh, something that I don't think has really been touched on, and I'm happy to bring three people, myself included, from totally different parts of the world, and then do a little trip on the Midwest get it into a DVD, and put it out hopefully before WrestleMania next year. December 4th, Freelance Wrestling, Chicago, Illinois. We're actually going to do a podcast before the show, and then that podcast will release when I release the Wrestling Road Diaries. December 5th, that's a Saturday, Cleveland, Ohio, AIWWrestling.com. They have been in every single Diaries, and we're keeping up that tradition. Johnny Gargano wrestled Brian Danielson in the very first one. You never know who's going to be on these cards. And December 6th, Alton, Illinois, which is basically the St. Louis area, PWCS in conjunction with St. Louis Anarchy Championship Wrestling, are putting on a show, and we will be there to conclude our little tour. Scotland, Japan, United States of America, documented for the idea of understanding comedy wrestling. I'm excited. Song of the Week this week is brought to you by Bombas Socks. Yes, socks that are amazing that I've been wearing. They basically have taken over my whole socks repertoire. I just wore them on a 10-hour drive all the way through Tokyo. Making my feet comfortable. They're great, and they're a great sponsor. Bombas.com slash Colt. You get 20% off your first order as big as you want. Let's talk about them. Athletic Leisure Socks re-engineered to look good, feel, and perform better. They got seamless toes. They got rid of the bumps that are on most of those socks up front. Blister tabs, performance footbeds, stay up technology so they don't fall down. The honeycomb support system? Running them, walking them, jogging them, wrestling them. I do. They do it all. Grab them in black, navy, gray, and white. Most importantly, Bombas don't a pair of socks for each pair that you buy, and they've donated over 300,000 pairs. Add some more to the list by doing something good for this world and doing something good for your feet. 100% happiness guaranteed. If you don't like them, they'll refund your purchase. B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash lowercase Colt. Get 20% off and start wearing some great socks. All right, the song this week is by Kyle and Oliver. I'm in Japan binge-watching shows while sitting in these rooms. I've already seen all of Better Call Saul, but why not give Paul Heyman a little love? These guys do. They also have a YouTube channel where they sing their hearts out. YouTube slash Kyle and Oliver. It's a parody called Better Call Paul. Enjoy it. We'll be back with Bob Holly. You can jump, take bumps, you can work, got a nice physique. But your max skill sucks, so you struggle to get heat. When they see you fight, the cross try to pop. If you want that push till you get to the top, you better call Paul. You better call Paul. You wanna tell the world that you're the next big thing, but you just can't seem to grasp that big brass ring. He'll eat, he'll sleep, he'll push repeat. He's a man behind the beast that conquered the streak. Paul, Paul, you better call Paul. You fight for your rights with the backs to the wall. Paul, you guys, the best of the ball. So you better call Paul. Paul, Paul, you better call Paul. You fight for your rights with the backs to the wall. Paul, you guys, best of the ball. So you better call Paul. Better call Paul.
Promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hey guys, we're also brought to you by Tops. I, I grew up on Tops, and yeah, it's playoff season, and I collected all of the 80s and 90s Cubs players, but I was also collecting the Chicago Bears, too. Emery Moorhead, Matsui, The Fridge, you name it, I had it. Now Tops has brought the world of trading cards to digital. Tops Huddle features officially licensed NFL digital cards. Fans can collect cards of their favorite players from their favorite teams. Watch your collection grow by opening packs and making trades with other users. The Tops app also does a lot more. You can play cards and earn points in real time, play daily fantasy style games based on how players perform on game day. Over 300 million Tops digital packs have been opened since 2012. For football and especially fantasy football fans, this app is a must have. Download it for free in the App Store or Google Play and get 10 free packs today. Again, that's Tops in the App Store or Tops.com. That's it. That's my start. Okay. Hi, Bob Holly. How are you doing? You look great as always. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I've, I've, always, I've always wanted to be one of those guys that... When I did finish up with uh, WWE, I, I never wanted to get out of shape and be like, you see me two or three years down the road, and it's like, okay, what happened to him? Well, I mean, my so one of the reasons why I've never made myself like a body guy, although you know I've been doing all right lately, but uh, well, you don't need to. It, well, is because I didn't want to be like in my older years and like have to maintain this fitness uh right. this look which <laughs> right because it's a lot of work i mean i'm not on the gas like i used to be obviously and yeah i've lost weight but i i've maintained uh you know i just i didn't want to get fat yeah so obviously coming off the gas and stuff like that you're not going to be as big as you used to be so i felt there was no need for it anymore i'm not on tv and i've always wanted you know, I've worked out all my life anyways, and I, I just because I've stopped wrestling and stopped being on TV, I really haven't stopped wrestling, but I've always enjoyed working out, and I probably always will until the day I die. Well, I mean, so right away, you and I commend you for it, and I think it's great. You're like, I got off the gas, meaning you were on, on steroids at right, one point, yeah. which, uh, which is kind of the reason for you being on this podcast. Not the reason for you being on this podcast is... Uh, you know, your openness mm -hmm. now in this new chapter of your life or career or whatever it may be. And I, I do want to say going like and, and we talked a little bit about this in Wales is this podcast is meant like for my my friends to be on to have a chat. Right. And like, honestly, I you were a person who I was like, oh, he'll, I, I would never want him on my show. <laughs> And I'm sorry to say, you know, <laughs> no, like, that's OK. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. That's... And especially after like this re that relationship or just, you know, like I see us as pals now. I hope yeah. that, I hope that's there. It's 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 mind blowing me, mind blowing to me a lot that there's this because there was a, a lot. I, I guess there's a reputation. There's stories. Uh, not so much. You know, I, I've witnessed a little bit of it. And when we talked about it in Wales, you didn't even. Because I said, oh, we met uh, at SmackDown in 2009, right. and you were like blown away that, and I think the first thing you did was apologize if I had ever, if you had ever done anything to me. Well, yeah, because I was I was just in a complete different mindset because they've always wanted, you know, they wanted you in character all the time, and it's like, and backstage, you know, I. I and I even apologize to you because I might have been going through personal issues. I don't know. I'm not just trying to make an excuse because I might not have been. And I've just, I'm one of those kind of people when I meet somebody, it's like, hey, how are you? And I go about my business. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was a stay away from you guy. Like, you didn't do anything to me, but I was like, oh, I don't want to, I don't even want to be around that guy. That was kind of my view. <laughs> well, and it goes back to probably hearing things that, that, uh, could be hearsay because of a reputation the only reputation i always thought i had was just because i was playing a tough guy on tv and it just for some reason it carried over because if you go back and think about it the reputation that i have supposedly i hurt people i'm too rough with people but if you stop and think and a lot of people don't stop and think how many people did I hurt wrestling? I never hurt anybody. Okay, yeah, I gave somebody a black eye and a bloody lip, but I can't tell you how many times I've had that. They, I've always just had this persona because I guess it's probably because the ring announcers and stuff like that would always say, 
oh, he's miserable, blah, blah, blah. He's, he's, an, he's angry all the time. But that was my character. But were you aware of the, I guess, especially amongst the, and then we can get into this later about like you being younger, but the younger, the younger stars of, of wrestling just being scared like shitless of you. I think it was just because of what they've, they've watched on TV and what they've, things that they might have read that somebody posted because a lot of that stuff is the furthest thing from the truth. Because honestly, when you met me, yeah. okay, you met me back, back in the day and I never, you never really got to know me. But when we were over in England and Wales together, you got to know me. Mm -hmm. Completely different, completely different from what you've heard or what you've felt. Yes, or anything. And and a thousand and eighty degrees. Right, yeah. and a lot of it too. We're under a lot of like WWE back in the day. We were under a lot of pressure, traveling all the time, tired. Um, I know your best friend can tell you this. Yeah, yeah. And so you don't really want to talk to people because you haven't been home, you know, or you've or you've had an argument or you got something going on at home. You know, so you got a million different things going through your mind and you might have caught me on a day where I just didn't feel like talking. And it's a good case too because I know how he's perceived by some of right. those guys too. Exactly. And I know the real I know the real. Right, him. and you do. Yeah. And I've never had any issue with him or anything and I've I've always I could relate to him so well. Mm. Because you know, I've sat back and I've I've observed him and stuff like that in catering and in the locker room and he's just one of those kind of guys where he's he shoots straight with you. Um, there's no BS with him and he just wants to be left alone, Yeah, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so I get that. And that's, that's kind of along the lines with me, not so much that I want to be left alone. It's just, I'm not one of those, I'm not a very outgoing person, so to speak, you know? Yeah. So, so I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I, but you did, I mean, you were, you like me, you made this apology so quick. So, I mean, you were aware of it though, right? Yeah, I guess I was. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's right there's stories of you, I guess, kicking people out of locker rooms, and, and yeah, but who have I kicked out of the yeah, locker and, room? And I guess, I mean, I don't know, right? Those are right. those are just stories, but those are tales that are told. Like, I wonder if you were like, you know, when the tales get told, like that, that's your reputation, that's all you have, right? You know, like, do you say to yourself, like, I need to stop this reputation, or I kind of like this reputation? But the thing is, too, also, if if I was as bad as people say, I, Vince would have got rid of me a long time ago. Mm -hmm. The boys police the locker room, and if it gets to a point where it's it's a lot of uh, mental and physical abuse, I promise you, Vince doesn't put up with that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's one of those things where. If somebody comes in for some reason and disres disrespects the boys, it, it, was, it was like the Miz. You know, he was eating his chicken. He was new. He wasn't there very long, and he got thrown out. I can't remember who threw him out of the locker room, but I think it was Benoit that threw him out. But he was eating yeah, fried like chicken over his, his, over his uh, gear bag. So And food's going all over the place, and it's like, okay, so... You know, he got thrown out because of that because it was he, disrespectful. And it's not that I, – I just don't think he knew how to play the locker room game or whatever. But, you know, so it's just – it's different circumstances for uh, different people. But the thing is, it's like I was – if I keep going back to – if I was that bad, why was I there 15 years? Right. Because well, you work for anybody, any company you work for. If If you're a prick to somebody – and you're constantly a prick to somebody, your boss is going to get in your ass and you're going to get fired. Yeah. Well, well there, so, but there, there has been like this change of at least publicly a change of attitude, right? I mean, would you agree with that? I, I'm just saying the idea that I would, I would scare it shitless of you and then all of a sudden, I, all of a sudden, like now you're my buddy, uh, I guess after the, the run, right? Well, yeah. Does that make sense? I mean, I mean, okay. I saw you that one time. Then the next time I saw, I saw, uh, yeah, I met you that one time. Yeah. But I'm saying not everybody. Everybody's like singing your praises, which is meant to be a compliment. Like everyone right. can't believe how nice Bob is. Can't believe that he's such a professional. Can't believe that he's he's a great dude. Yeah. When a reputation, you know, for years would say otherwise. So there, you, you're not even saying there's been a switch or like a I don't I don't think there was. No, you know? I don't think there was. I've just, always been like yeah. that. But it. In the locker room, I mean, you can ask anybody in the locker room. I got along great with everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd kid around, joke around, stuff like that. But, you know, there comes, you know, 
I'm one of those kind of guys like I can get along with anybody, but just don't screw me over. <laughs> right. You know, and 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 like I don't know, I I guess because I did go through a lot of personal problems when I was in WWE, you know, here and there and stuff and and you know, I I don't know. It's yeah. it's it what was that women, women problems? Yeah, just, yeah, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, so I just which everybody goes through, but um, plus I always had on my mind. Okay, you know, are they are they going to do anything with me? When are they going to do anything with me? And there's a lot of pressure too. And we'd be on the day on the road, you know, thirty days, thirty days out of out of the month or whatever and wrestling every single night and you're not going to be in a good mood every single day you can't be happy 24 7 and people are going to catch you at the wrong time so and and it and also i mean in all honesty being away from wwe has relieved relieved a lot of stress i mean that's what i'm i that's my number one to the thinking yeah of this of the situation and that's why I, that's why people ask me all the time hey are you gonna go back do you want to go back i really don't because i don't want the stress i don't i i enjoy my time at home i do what i want to do i travel when i want to travel. i work when i want to work and i don't have the stress of being under the gun under the under a microscope scope 24 7 and mm. feeling like i was on audition every time i worked yeah because i did i felt like i was on audition every single night i don't even after 10 years working there i felt like i was on a, on an audition and that's a lot of stress that's a lot of pressure yeah and why i wouldn't say why but like you would think that would go away after 10 years and you were there what 15 years 15 yeah and it never did because it just never did because and and the reason why is I'd have a couple bad matches and it would get back to me that something was wrong. You know, Bob, what's wrong with Bob? Why is he having bad matches all of a sudden? And then right away, job scared? And all, Yeah, job scared. Like after those two bad matches, you're like, oh, fuck, I'm going to get fired? Well, I, I never really worried about being fired because I could always get a job because I'm a welder by trade. So that's one thing. Whenever they were making cuts every year, cuts came around. I was like, okay, well, if I get let go, I get let go because I can get a job tomorrow. So I never really worried about it. But I didn't want to get fired because I, I liked wrestling. Mm -hmm. I liked wrestling and, and, you know, they always really took good care of me. And, uh, but it was just one of those things where just, I always felt like I was under a micro microscope and I, always, I was always thinking, you know, when's my time coming? When's my time coming? And just when every time I think, okay, it's, it's, I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. And then I wouldn't be. So, it, it's like. Did did you accept that you were the that you were a middleman or a mid? -card I did. Man? Yeah, I did. But I always felt like I could break out. Yeah, and I never did. But I just they they had a tendency. The reason I felt like that because I had a tendency to feel like I was under a micro I, under a microscope. I felt like I was on audition. Yeah. So I didn't mind putting people over. Don't get me wrong. But it's like when you're always putting people over, it's like when I'd come back from an injury. All right, let's see what Bob can do. Yeah. And that's not the case for a lot of guys because they get put right back in a, a top spot. And so whenever I'd come back from an injury, then it would be like, okay, let's see how Bob does. Let's test him for a little while. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what they did. And and I would, I would, and I know I passed the test because they'd keep using me. So, right. <laughs> okay, so so that stress is is gone now, though. Yeah, that's the stress audition is gone. stress. Yeah, well, welder by trade. Did you ever, did you ever mi mi mix with the rings? Did you ever like give them advice on any of those? No, no, that's no, not, okay. uh, no. If something broke, I never, I never volunteered to weld it back. Uh, you you started off by talking about uh, getting off the gas, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in, I guess, in the yeah. the steroid, uh, not culture or. Uh, mindset do you, did you feel like pressure to to get on i didn't no i never felt pressure i just thought and i don't mean from the the guy but right yeah, yeah no i never felt pressure it's just it just seemed like that was the thing that was what everybody was doing and it 
seemed like, okay, maybe if I change the way I look, I'll get more TV time. Did you ever dabble before wrestling? I did, but I never was... I never knew enough about I was it. Say, to, as educated, as educated, yeah, as educated about. Because when you start hanging out with those guys, you get real, edu- you get educated real fast. Yeah. And and when I came into WWE, I knew about working out, but I didn't know how to work out. I worked out, but I didn't know how to work out. And then when I got with um, Sid and stuff like that, guys like him, they showed me the proper way to work out and the way to eat right. So it just evolved from there. Yeah. And I'll never <laughs> forget. I was off. They had, uh, it was, we were running three crews, and then they cut cut it down to two. We had an A and a B crew, and this was like 95, I think. And I was off for a little while. and Off the road? Off the road, yeah. yeah. So I started doing my homework at home, got on some decking, some tests, and came back, and I was like completely had a completely different look. Mm-hmm. And I was in a tag match with uh, PJ, and um, and uh, just as Aldo Montoya, Aldo or? Montoya, and it was it was funny because we were working with the Headbangers, and I about broke PJ's hand when I when I went when I tagged out. It, <laughs> it was kind of fun. You had to be there. PJ could tell a good story about that. But yeah, I came back, and I I had a completely different look. And the thing is, look, the way I the way I look at what I did or anybody's choice, what they want to do, that's their decision. It's their body. It's just like people drinking alcohol. OK, if if people say, oh, you must have done steroids, they're bad for you. Shame on you, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, OK, well, you drink, don't you? Well, yeah, um, you smoke, don't you? Mm, don't smoke. But there's people that do or whatever. Um you eat like shit, don't you? Yeah. yeah, you go to McDonald's and eat that stuff. So you tell me, which which is worse for you? Everything in moderation. Right. I, I think that, like, because I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't do steroids or right. do drugs, but, man, I, like, I know when I'm having, like, four Diet Cokes a day and yeah. then aspartame for the last 25 years. And I've seen the documentaries, and, and you, you, you see information. Like, I, I'm not a big, ad, I'm not this guy who's like, don't do steroids. I don't do them. Right. But, like, and even with marijuana, I don't, you know, I don't smoke marijuana, but like I see these, everyone puts out these great cases for why it's not bad for you. Right. You know, it's and, not the worst for you. Right. And the thing is, it to me, it, it helped my joints because we're bumping every single night too. And, you know, and I did it for personal reasons because I obviously I wanted to look better. Right. And, and I don't care who it is or who they are. If somebody tells you, "Oh no, I don't do," it, they're they're full of shit. They're they're lying. Every you know, you can tell the people that do them, and when they tell you no, they're insulting your intelligence. <laughs> yeah, and it's so. But you know, it's that cho- their choice because it's like, I because I brought up a good point in my book about okay, how many people do you know of that steroids have killed, or like alcohol. Look at look at the problems alcohol creates, but that's okay to do that. I mean, yeah, it's bad on your liver. It's it, and people go get behind a wheel, kill people, drunk driving. You have domestic problems constantly with alcohol, and you constantly hear that. And but with somebody on steroids, of course, you hear about roid rage, and whether that's that's the true thing or not, you know, I don't I don't know. But the thing is, it's like. I think because people are uneducated about it, mm-hmm. that's why they think it's so bad for you. Yeah, anything is bad for you if you abuse it or take too much. It's like anything. Taking steroids is no different than an alcohol, somebody drinking alcohol, getting behind the wheel of a car and going and kill, killing somebody. You know, that's, that's the way I look at it. Right. It, at least. But again, it goes back to moderation everything in moderation, moderation because yeah. if, if you abuse it and abuse it long enough yes of course it's going to be bad for you right so so i mean but now off clean you don't right, feel now, the need for it because you don't you're not here to impress not, no I, right. I, yeah right and the thing is is i go to the doctor every year for my insurance and my 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 blood counts good my white and red blood cell count my liver Everything's good. My kidneys are fine. Everything is fine. I have no no side effects from using them at all. 
at all. That's and great. I go to the doctor every year. Were you scared of that? Um, I was concerned. I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared. Yeah, but, you know, because I, I, I honestly didn't know. You know, because I did them for like 10 years. Yeah. And so I was... I was concerned. I wasn't scared. I didn't feel like anything was wrong, but you never know. Mm -hmm. So that's what those tests are for. Right. That, right. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So, and, and I was honest with my doctor and everything and told him what I did. And, and so, but yeah, I've, I, in fact, I went to the doctor this past June and everything is fine. My blood pressure is fine. Everything is good. When you're honest with the doctor, is he just like, okay. Like, yeah, he's, he, yeah. They understand. He's, yeah, he understands. Not that, I'm sure nothing's new to those guys. No. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Uh -uh. no. Um, so, what, but I, I mean, I have no problem telling people, yeah, I was on them. Okay, and what's the problem? <laughs> you know, yeah. I have no problem. You're, you're, not, you're an honest guy. You, yeah, uh, I, I don't care because it's, it's my life. It's my body. And, and if somebody asks me a question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. But don't condemn me for it because i'm sure there's things that other people do that you know you could point the finger at them for mm -hmm. so at least i'm being honest with them and i'm not you know that i'm not oh i know yeah. no, no i know you're not i know i know you're i'm just, just curious you're, about it. you're it's just it's, curious yeah, yeah. you just you know i'm you're just here you're doing your job you're asking yeah. me questions well I, you know and just a lot like you said a lot of people deny 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 and so it's it's refreshing almost when someone's open about their yeah. life and who they are and i don't know why they deny it are they embarrassed because well, it's it? illegal you know maybe illegal <laughs> right well smoking marijuana is illegal well yeah. it was i mean and a lot of but you know people would admit to doing that sure you know so i, I don't well i, I mean in, sen the in the sense of and probably for the same reason that i don't do a lot of stuff is like society and, and the rules you, you know, like the right. law says not to do it. So I was yeah. like, all right, I won't do we it. We live in the biggest hypocritical society on the planet. We really do. People could point a finger at you for you doing something, but they they, they fail to realize uh, they have a closet too. Mm -hmm. And Well, they, I, they all, I mean, they all do. Like yeah. everything comes out. Yeah, everything yeah, does. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's amazing. The, I, I just think like, especially in politics, just the scumbags that come out of the woodwork and you yeah. see this Bill Cosby stuff, you know, it's just like, yep. fuck, yep. Every, everyone's a piece of shit, I yeah. think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I, I, you know, I don't get into politics and stuff like that I try because that politics just pisses me off when I hear. I mean, the, I don't either, but just you see these guys right. that I don't know that are in high power positions that have been scamming the system for years right. or have been sleeping with this person or, is, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. They're all just, they're all just gross. Right. You know, it, everyone is. Yeah. <laughs> Every politician in Congress to me is, is the biggest crook on the planet. They're yeah. worse than somebody, you know, go committing robbery or doing something or, you know, committing a crime. To me, they're the worst. They're the, they're the absolute worst. Yeah. And then they want to throw stones at, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Okay. Let's get let's get into some wrestling. Okay. When when we when we, uh, when we did the live podcast in Wales, you I, you and I forgot already, but you condemned me for not knowing. Uh, sorry, I used condemned if you used used it, but uh, now it's a word in my mind um, uh, for not knowing where the territory that you were in first. So I, I guess I am. Like I, we didn't get into like how you got into wrestling, and I know that's the basic question, but like I'd like to break it down or, or see. Um, Exactly, like ex you know, I, I like that struggle of getting to where you got. So you want you want to know what, how I got, yeah, where I got my yeah, start, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, especially like before the WWF stuff. And then I like the idea of the struggle of like being that undercard guy and getting that switch too. But I think we hit on that a little bit. Yeah. But yeah. so you grew up in Alabama. Yep. Uh, well, actually, I was born in California. My family moved to Oregon, so we moved to Oregon, and then after I graduated from high school, I went to Alabama. And so you, you went to high school in Oregon? Yep. Oh, yep. I know that. Grants Pass, Oregon. That's where I, I went to school and uh, from fourth grade till I graduated. But uh, I was born in Glendale, California. But Oregon's kind of like what part of I, not to Southern Oregon. It's kind of like it's really this, beautiful there. Is yeah, but right, it's like very alone. Like I, I'm, it's not like a big city. No, no, it was a small city. It was like twenty one thousand people. Yeah, like I mean, it's still kind of like so. When I think of Alabama, I think small town America. But also Oregon, you could think kind of small town. Right. Did it have the same vibe? No, completely different. Comple and what yeah. in terms of what? Well, Mobile has Mobile has some like over hundred thousand people there. So it was, it was a big a transition a city, for yeah. me. Yeah, because I came from a really small town, and then what was then the move to Alabama? What was the what? What was the move? What was the reason for the move to Alabama? To to get into wrestling. To start wrestling. And, and well, I I knew I could get into wrestling there, but 
the girl that I was seeing, she got pregnant and her family was moving. And it's like, if I wanted to be around my kid, I had to move. Where She was moving to that area? Yeah. yeah. So, Mobile. and I thought, well, this would be a good opportunity because wrestling is like crazy in, in Alabama. And, and, I, and I grew up watching Portland wrestling. And there was really, because back then in those days, everything was so tight-lipped. I mean, you couldn't get in. Even if you knew somebody, it was near impossible to get in. And what, like, what years was this? Oh, gosh. This was uh, 82, 83. Okay. 84. And you're like 16, 17, 18, trying to get 18, in, 18, in yeah. the Portland area? Yeah. And, and you I couldn't w- find a way in? No, and I even went to one of the shows and tried to talk to Buddy Rose, and he just blew me off. Wow. And then, uh, and I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I, Were you a wrestling kid growing up? Just, yes, you, you oh, absolutely, wrestling? yes. I loved it. Because when I was, when we were living in California, on Saturday mornings, there was a thing called roller derby. Yeah. And it, roller derby was big back then. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. So every Saturday, I couldn't wait for Saturday mornings. Of course, me and my brother, we would fight because he wanted to watch something else, and I wanted to watch roller derby. So then I got into all that, and that's all I could think about was roller derby because <laughs> I just I love the violence of it. You know? Did you roller rough. skate? No, I didn't. Okay. I, cu- I couldn't. <laughs> and so, And then when we moved up to Oregon and we got cable TV, the first thing I saw on TV was big time wrestling out of Sacramento, California. I was like, whoa, what is this? Yeah. You know, Pat Patterson was there, Rocky Maivia, um, Bob Roop, a lot, a lot of guys. I mean, there was a lot of guys from that area. Uh, Pepper Gomez. I talk about it in my book. But anyway, so, and that came on at three o'clock, from three to four in the afternoon. I was like, wow, this is awesome. Because it was the first weekend that we had cable. Yeah. So then... Did you quickly give up on, on your oh, love of roller derby? Oh, I did. Absolutely. <laughs> that was gone. I didn't even think about that anymore. Right. So then that night at 8.30, flipping through the channels, because back then you had to get up and physically turn mm-hmm. the channel. Mm-hmm. And so came across Portland Wrestling. I was like, well, what is this? You know, and my stepdad, he would sit there and watch it with me, and it was on for an hour and a half. I was like, wow. And I was like, instantly, that was what I wanted to do. Were you like me where like you just like weren't gravitated to one person, but just the, the, the idea of it all? Just the whole idea of, of just fighting, just I guess. The, the physical, yeah, the physical, phys- physicality of it. I, I just really enjoyed that. And of course, I wasn't smart, obviously, yeah. and I thought it was real. And, um, First time I saw Playboy Buddy Rose, I was like, that is my guy right there. And I just, I, at first I hated him because he was a big heel, you know. I hated him. And It's uh, interesting, the, bo- the body guy of Bob Holly. Yeah. Thing, like Playboy Buddy <laughs> yeah, Rose. All right. You 300 know? pounds. Well, because, and then, like, Jimmy Snuka was there. Mm-hmm. And I saw him. I was like, whoa, I want to look like him. And then, of course, Jesse Ventura was there, too. It's a good thing you, you didn't him. say I want to look like Playboy right, Buddy no, Rose. Right, no, yeah, right, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then so... And I was just totally taken back by the way they looked. And that's when I had my mom go get me the the weights with the concrete, the plastic weights with the concrete. I thought you were going to say, go get me some steroids. No, yeah. <laughs> I had no idea what those were back then. But no, I, so I started, that's why, that's why a lot of, that's why I started working out mm-hmm. too. And of course, watching um, Incredible Hulk on TV too, because I saw that and you know, and I, so I wanted to look like that, mm. and which is, every kid that sees that thinks that's what they want to look like. And so, but anyway, so I got hooked on that big time. Yeah, and couldn't and so and couldn't find your way into Oregon. So when you went to Alabama, uh, how did you find your way in? Did you find it easier? No, no, I, I, because I, I there was a Continental Championship Wrestling, which came out of uh, um, is either Birmingham or Mon- I think it was Birmingham. And that was like Danny Davis was running. Danny was, Davis. Was he running? He was, in he was the nightmare. Right. He was one of the nightmares. Mm-hmm. Danny Davis, um, uh, um, Bob Armstrong, he was there. Fuller? Maybe? Fullers were there. Yeah. yeah, all those guys. And uh, it was just, it was good wrestling. And of course, I then I came across um, World Class Championship. I mean, there was wrestling every on every channel just okay. about on Saturday morning. And that's, that's how I'd spend my Saturdays watching wrestling and trying to figure out how to get in i even wrote a four-page letter saying just and i wish i i 
Oh, you can't slide. Uh, you sent it away. Can, yeah, I sent it away, but I, I wish f- I could remember everything I wrote. But I, I Who'd sent you write it to? A Continental Championship Wrestling. Just Dear Continental Just dear, Championship. Yeah, yeah, whoever got their mail or whatever and and tried. I think it was the referee who was in charge because I, at the end of the show, it gave his name and, and all this you know information or uh, for tickets and all this stuff, too. I was going to say, usually it's to send money. Right. But for you, it's... Yeah, it was just, I'm sending a letter. And, they, and it was like... Do you think they saw this letter and they're like, well, there's no money They in probably here. just <laughs> threw it away. It's four pages. They're not going to take the time to read it. Yeah. But I didn't know that. I was trying everything I could to get in. And so then I I was working in an automotive shop, and the, they just hired this new manager. And he he knew I liked wrestling because I talked about it, and he got to know me a little bit and stuff. And I said, I love wrestling. And so they started bringing a TV down, and he goes, well, I know this girl that knows this guy. He wrestles for Gulf Coast Championship Wrestling. And I can, I'll get in touch with her and see if, what she can do. So long story short, she got in touch with him. Um, he came by the shop. I met him, and I was just like, "Holy crap!" You know, I was I was just like in hog heaven. Yeah. I was just like, "Oh my god!" This First time ever seeing a wrestler or meeting one in person. Meeting one in person and yeah. having a real like and real life real conversation. conversation. So I was, and also just, you're an adult at this point, right? Ish. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I was like you know 20 years old. So I was just like, you know, I didn't know what to say. And I just, you know, and, and he just, he was really standoffish, really, really standoffish. It was actually. Do you think it was his personality or protecting the business? I think he was protecting the business okay. because once I got to know him a little bit and stuff, he was, he was fine, but he was just protecting the business because in fact, it was, uh, Paul Bearer's, uh, cousin, so to speak. He grew up with Paul Bearer. It was Marcel Pringle. He kind of, he grew up with him. He never made it anywhere really he never made it big or anything. He was good enough because he he could talk on the microphone really good. So uh, anyway, I was I was constantly hounding him, and he was trying to figure out a way to get me off of his back because I guess I was starting to annoy him, which I could see how. And so you want to get in though, man? Right. This is your only option. <laughs> right. It was, and he I guess he just didn't understand that. So I, he he started having a little resentment towards me. And I was wanting to hang out with him and stuff. And obviously, he's like, no, I got things to do, blah, 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 or whatever. He didn't even know me. And so he finally, I called him one day, and I was like, he said, hey, I know this place. They're opening up a school in Pensacola. And he thought, this is how I can get the guy off my back. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't work because then I was wanting him to go over there with me. Uh, Because the first time I went over there, I signed up and everything to the school because it was just a school. And how, how long of a trip was that? It was an hour and 10 minutes for me every day. Okay, and so 1982, because I've had Larry Sharp on here, and we've talked about the idea of the wrestling school. I mean, those weren't, uh, in 1982, a wrestling school wasn't very uh, prevalent, I don't think. No, they weren't. It was was 82, 83, somewhere around there. It wasn't quite 82. I, I can't remember exactly when it was. But it was the idea of like, hey, any Joe can come off the street? Yeah, if you paid if you paid the money, you mm-hmm. could. It was like thirty five hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and I didn't have any money. Okay, and for some reason they worked it out with me, and I, which I never wound up paying. They didn't make me pay them, uh, and and it, I don't know why, but they never did. I I think because they knew I was determined because they tried to break me. And, I mean, they brought Bob Sweetan and Rip Tyler tried to break me. So those are the two guys who were running the school. Yeah. Okay. And, and I was scared to death, death of Bob Sweetan because I remember watching him on Southwest Championship Wrestling from Texas, and uh, and I remember seeing him, and I was like scared to death of him. Yeah. So you walk into the school, and they're just both sitting there. Uh, yeah. They they were sitting there, and there was actually it was just Bob Sweetan sitting there. Rip Tyler came in every once in a while and and helped out, but it was just mainly Bob Sweetan. So this was his project, this yeah, school. Yeah. What was it called? Do you actually, remember? it was WOW. They they didn't name it WWW WOW. It was just just a basic wrestling school. Is all it was. It was at Border Street Arena in Pensacola, Florida, and because Rip Tyler and Sweetan went over to Japan a lot, they got hooked up with this guy, uh, Mister Ito. I guess he was a big deal in Japan. Okay. At the at, back in that day, and so they somehow they got with him and made a deal where they wanted to start running a TV show, and that's when it, and after because after about six six eight months of 
the wrestling school, then they decided to start running a TV show. Who you think the guys in Japan wanted them to run a TV show? No, it wasn't the guy. Just Mr. Ito was the money man. He's the one that funded it. Okay. It, it was his. De- it was so it they was, wanted the. And here, can we assume that they wanted their stars to be on TV? So they just made a TV show. I honestly, I don't know how <laughs> everything came about. Yeah. All I know is Mr. Ito was the money man. Okay, that's all. He was the boss. He was the one paying everybody. That's all I know. And um, so after about six months of training, they just started W O W because the trainees and stuff we were all sitting there. And Rip Tyler said, you know, this is going to be one of the biggest wrestling companies in the world. You won't ever have to work for anybody else. And they did those speeches I remember back then that. Too. Yes, <laughs> I remember that speech very well. And I was working, I was holding down a regular job too. So I was working at eight because I worked in a cryogenic plant. I was a welder, I was a, a stainless TIG welder. And I welded pipe. So, and, and it, I did x ray welding. Hmm. So I'd be at work at 6 30 in the morning and I'd work till. 3.30, and if we had to do overtime, I'd have to work till 6.30. So I'd work either 8 or 10 hours, whichever, whatever was required at the time, because we did a lot of, you know, we had overtime, we did our straight time, and then when we started getting busier, then obviously overtime kicked in, and guys were having to stay. So I had to, I still had to go to Pensacola to train, and I wasn't going to miss it. So I would work till... If I did a 10-hour day, work my 10 hours, I'd go home, take a shower, and I'd haul ass over to Pensacola. Then I would train for two or three hours over there, drive back home, and get up the next day and do it all over again. And you're also helping with an infant, right? Or, yes. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. you went to be, you moved right. to be close to your kid. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then that's, you know, and I, and I wanted to wrestle, and that's, I was determined to do it. I didn't care what it took. I was I was so broke that I was looking for change anywhere I could. I was getting aluminum cans, taking them in just so I could have gas money to go back and forth. Right. So So the TV show comes up. So the TV show comes up and they, they throw you on TV? They threw me on TV. Your first was your first match on TV? Uh yes. I love those. And I was a baby stories. face and it was awful. <laughs> it was awful. I had to wear I did I was not comfortable wearing the like the the wrestling tights like the the trunks. Mm-hmm. I wasn't cuff- comfortable wearing that. And so because I, of your body or because of the weird just like being naked. Because they just being naked. Yeah, okay. You know, my, my body wasn't bad, but it wasn't good either. It was okay. I don't know. So as, as a kid, like being the same way like obsessed with wrestling that you were, like I just always envisioned like, oh, that's what I'll wear that one day. Well, I did, I because I like the long tights. Okay, because I've seen wrestlers that wear the long tights, and I just I like that. So I ordered the long tights, and I showed up in the long tights, and Rip Tyler said, "Nope, you won't be wearing those. You're gonna wear trunks." So I had to order trunks, and I just oh my god, I hated that the shine to the blue spandex shiny blue trunks or whatever. I wore the, I hated. It. I was so uncomfortable wearing. Them. <laughs> so what was your name when you debuted? It was just Bob Holly. Okay. It was Bob Holly, and so, but actually, you know what? Let me back up okay. because before they started doing WOW TV at the Border Street Arena, there it was hot, no air. You know, it's humid down in Florida, just just sticky hot. They would run just regular wrestling shows, and they'd bring in a couple people from all around. Um, so they'd bring in Ron Starr, the Batten Twins guys like that and they put me on and i was i was a heel the because they i couldn't remember if they gave me a choice anyway i was i was a heel and it was just they videotaped everything it wasn't for tv or nothing and my very first match uh it was awful it was god and i thought and i thought i was doing good yeah and and i watch it back like that videotape only exists at my house. <laughs> that videotape, nobody will ever see. Oh, come it. on, put it on YouTube no, for me. <laughs> no, it is because I promise you, Colt, you would, you people would pick that apart and they would laugh 
their ass off because I laugh at it and I get embarrassed watching it. Yeah. The it's ha- hard for me to watch. Is the hair flowing? The Physically hair, just, long just, hair, yeah. <laughs> long hair. I come out with sunglasses. I had the long tights. I just uh, thought I was the shit. I that's, did. That's I, part of the fun though. Oh, I know. But, but it, everything I did made absolutely no sense. My lockups were horrible. It looked like I was, I was uh, trying to dance with somebody. My drop kicks were god awful. I'd throw a drop kick and it'd be in their midsection. It was just, it, it was terrible. Was Sweet Tan on you after that? Or he was like, yeah, that's all right. You know, it's funny. He never really said anything. The only time he ever said anything is when we were training and we were about to, to die right there in the middle of the road. He'd just make us keep going running stairs and stuff like that he just make us keep going keep going keep going never never really got critiqued about wrestling so i thought i was doing okay Mm -hmm. and it's funny because when you look back on it i just you know after talking to you i just now realized they never said anything well that's don't do it like that right do it like this or they never really corrected anybody why do you think that is i don't know pat rose was the one who was really trying to help people change the way they do things and because pat rose was one of the trainers too he came he came in a a few weeks after it had started and and started training too he had moved back he moved down to pensacola to help out sweet it wasn't a cash grab for him was it i I honestly i don't know you don't know i don't i mean because there's you know if it was a cash grab he just wouldn't give a fuck right and i don't think he did he just he enjoyed watching people suffer (laughs) seriously he did and a lot of people quit okay a lot of people, they got their money because a lot of people paid up front, $3,500 up front. And I guess because of knowing Marcel Pringle and that being Paul Bear's cousin, I guess they just kind of worked with me on that deal and, and, and just kind of just let it go. I, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't know. I so, don't know so you saw people go in and out of that I saw place. them go in and Did out. Did anybody ever make it with you? I was the only one. The only one. Only one that stuck it out. Huh. I'll never forget this one guy. His name was Carrie. I can't remember his last name, but we had just got there and I had got in the ring and I was doing some stuff and I got out and Pat and Carrie was sitting on the apron. He's a big, tall guy. And tall to the point where you're like, oh, this guy will be famous. Yeah, wrestler. yeah. He yeah. looked like he looked like a wrestler. Yeah. And he he was he, he and I thought he was pretty decent. And so I get in the ring and get in there with another guy and we're rolling around and stuff like that and practicing and everything. And I get out and Pat comes in and he said, Carrie, why don't you get in the ring? Carrie's like, oh, I'm tired. I don't feel like getting in there. That was the wrong thing to say. <laughs> Pat told him, get your ass in the ring. Pat pretty much beat the ever living shit out of him and told him to get out of the ring. And after that, he quit. You know, And it's like, if, if you're too tired to get in the ring and you're there to practice, why why are you... It's like why? Why are you even? Why are you showing up mm-hmm. if you're too tired? And I, th- I think also uh, people listening to this can can almost get it a little bit. Not, not like a product of your environment, but like this is what you went through. Right. So when people hear Bob's was tough on this guy or tough on that guy, but I was never tough to the point where I would hurt anybody. Sure, but you saw the you saw the weed out process, right? I saw the weed out process, and and I mean, it, it's like it it's like when we would run stadium stairs. It's like he, Sweet Town would make us run until our legs were spaghetti, until we couldn't run anymore. And then we would get up and we would physically force ourselves to run. And he just, I remember him just sitting back laughing his ass off at us because everybody was just laid out because we couldn't go no more. Mm. And he would ride a bicycle. We'd run two miles because as soon as we'd get to the arena, the first thing we did was run. So we'd run two miles, and if one guy lagged back, he, Sweet Tan wouldn't say a word. When we got back to the arena, he's like, we're running it again. So we'd have to run again. And by the time we got finished doing running the two miles and then running stairs and all that stuff, by the time we got in the ring, we were already shot. Right. And you, you had to push through it. So when it came time for you I mean, to debut and to, and to get on the road... You were ready. I was re- I was in good shape. Yeah, I'd yeah, imagine. I was in good shape. I could, I could go forever. Um, kind of. Do you have a little bit, little bit of a timeline? We're kind of winding down here. Oh, we uh, are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, like a little bit of a timeline of. So the first thing was that uh, 
was it WOW or was it golf? It was W O W okay. World Organization Wrestling. So that show that he put on. It went for like two years. Okay. And then the money that Ito was sending in was going in somebody's pocket, so then Ito came and shut it down. Okay, so it was you, good. Then you went what was your next move after? My next move was Memphis. I went to Memphis. Went on, on whose recomm on your Pat Rose. Okay. Because uh Pat Rose took a liking to me and said, Hey, let's go to Memphis as a tag team. Now uh I'm sorry if this is wrong, but I don't think it is. Pat Rose was part of the new Midnight. No, he wasn't. Uh, no, he was. He was up in Georgia Championship Wrestling. He remember when uh, he was an extra. When when okay, he wasn't. Who's the guy when Jim Cornette and Paul? Oh, Paul Randy Hay Rose. Randy Rose. Randy I'm sorry. Rose. Okay. okay. Yeah, I got it wrong. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, it was Pat, Pat Rose. Rose. All right. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> and so we went up there, and. Run, that kind of runs course in about a, a few weeks. In Memphis? In Memphis, yeah, because okay. they weren't paying us anything. Yeah. I'll never forget. But he took you up as like kind of like a, an extra guy or whatever? No, he took me up there as a tag partner. Okay. Because he, he called Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett, and said, hey, I'm, I'm bringing a guy up. And I guess he had seen video of me and said, yeah, come on, we'll put you guys together. And they were going to make us a team. What was your tag name? Uh, they, we really didn't have a name. It was, it was just Pat Holly. Rose and Bob Holly. Okay. And they were putting us over on TV and, and stuff like that. We do the house shows. I'll never forget, we got in a lot of heat, a lot of trouble, because I took Steiner, Scott Steiner, and threw him over the top rope because he was tagging with uh, Billy Travis. And I'll never forget, I can't remember what town it was. He was very young, was, Scott Steiner, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was still, he was, he was a big boy back then, yeah. too. And I <laughs> threw him over the top because I didn't know. You throw somebody over the top in Memphis, and it's a DQ. And boy, we got a lot. He almost lost our job over that. But anyway, long story short, we didn't last long there because you'd work six days and drive all over the world, and we didn't make any money. Mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't afford to eat. I couldn't. I couldn't afford to get a hotel. I couldn't afford to eat. I, you know, sleep. We were sleeping in a car in the rest area. Hmm. I mean, it was it was brutal. It was brutal. And I'll never forget. Jarrett came in. We were in Evansville, Indiana, and we got paid every two weeks in Evansville. It was every two weeks, I think it was. And it was on a Wednesday. And everybody was, they got their checks and they were just like not happy. Yeah. And I can see why. And Jarrett walks in and says, What's everybody look so down for? And somebody spoke up and said, You get a check like we get, <laughs> you'd be <laughs> pissed off too. And then he fired the whole lot. Yeah. Room. <laughs> and, and so he just turned around and walked out. <laughs> and obviously, you know, Jeff's, his dad's going to take care of him, obviously, which, you know, and that's understandable because he's a son. But, and they were doing good business. I mean, the houses weren't great, but I think they could have paid us a little bit more to get us to stay. And then I'll never forget where we, um, we did. Every occasionally we were able to stay in a hotel here, put our money together and stay in a hotel. And I'll never forget AWA was interested in me. And so uh, I think it was Greg Gagne, or no, no, it was uh, Ray Stevens called me. Ray Stevens called me. First of all, that's cool on its own. Yeah. Ray Stevens just calls you. Yeah. The guy who used to watch big time wrestling. Yes, right? <laughs> absolutely. Because he was a big, he was one of the top guys there with Pat Patterson. Yeah. And uh, so Ray Stevens calls me and he's interested. And I, I, I never really gave him an answer because I was with Pat. We were tag team there. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, so I talked to one of the guys, and he's like, hey, you got to do what you got to do. You got to look after yourself. If they want you, you need to go. That's a good opportunity. And so I pulled Pat to the side, and I'll never forget, I went to the pool and talked to him, and he blew a freaking gasket and went off on me. That's not what you want to hear. No. I mean, went off on me. And I felt so – I mean, he made me feel that big because he's the one that brought me up to Memphis. You know, and then he was like, this is my shot. I finally get a shot, and I've got a good tag partner. I mean, just going on and on about how it's finally an opportunity for him to be able to do something in wrestling. Yeah. How do you look at that? Because, uh, you know, you would think, like, oh, the good guy would say, yeah, go be a star. But, like, how did, how did you look at that? Like, did you agree or in hindsight? I, did, you... I didn't know. I didn't I didn't. In know. hindsight, looking back. In hindsight, it, I – in hindsight, I think – if somebody has an opportunity, they need to take it, whether regardless of who you're with, you know, because it, it it boils down to it's every man for himself in this business. It really is. Well, so he was. I mean, his mind was every man for himself. I need you, right? Otherwise, I'm fucked. Right. Yeah. 
And so I, I, cause I told him, I said, I just got on and he didn't know I was talking to AWA. Mm -hmm. And so I told him, I said, I was talking to Ray Stevens and he just turned, he just gave me this look and I was scared of Pat anyway. (laughs) I really was. And he just gave me this look. And, uh, then I proceeded to tell him and before I even got completely finished telling him, he just like lit me up from one end to the other. Well, you can't be a team after that, right? No. Yeah, of course. And I ended up, actually, I ended up calling Ray and said, hey, I'm going to have to pass because Pat made me feel that small, you know, and I, and I didn't, I didn't know, you know, if it's one of those things that, you know, you always say, if I knew now, if I know what I know now, if I knew then it's one of those things. That's wild. So there's AWA calling you, you're getting nothing in Memphis. You know, you're getting nothing and you still say no, but then you're like, we're done with Memphis. Right, because yeah. at then, then it was me and Pat. Pat just had nothing to do with me any, after that. Yikes. You know, we still finished our commitments with Memphis and everything, and uh, and we just we we stopped riding together. I ended up finding a ride with somebody else. Uh, we just we did our work together. We worked together as a team in the ring, but that was it. Mm-hmm. You know, we did it. We didn't talk or anything. And so I ended up. I was in um, I was in Louisville, and I called actually called Marcel. And said, "Hey, can you come up here and pick me up and, and take me back home so I can get my job back?" Huh. And that's he came, your job at the at, at, at the, the plant, welding place. The, wow. Yeah, at the plant, and because he worked there also. Yeah, and so he drove he drove ten hours up to Louisville, wow. picked me up, and took me back. Yeah, yeah, and that was the end of it. And then I kind of I guess I want to hit until the the maybe the the. The WWF and like I know you did. Uh, well, I did Smoky Mountain. So yeah. So the next step was the next what? step was uh, actually the next step was I went to Atlanta up to uh, and do did stuff for them. I only did it twice. The, the WCW jobs. stuff. Yeah, doing jobs for yeah. WCW, and uh, that's how I met Cornette. Gotcha. Long story short, Cornette pulled me to the side because I, I worked with Jackie Fulton, and I I made him look silly. I didn't mean to. I was just it was one of those deals where I kept waiting on him, waiting on him. I. We'd do something, and I'd be up before him waiting. And Ron Simmons, first thing Ron Simmons ever said to me, and because the first time I saw Ron Simmons, I said, oh, my God, this guy's scary just looking at him. And uh, first thing he said is, damn, they need to be giving you a job instead. They need to be pushing you instead of him. So anyway, I was walking down the hallway, and Cornette stopped me and said, hey, you need to quit coming up here. And I was like, well, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to get a job because uh, I just got out of the office. If, if, If I was still in the booking committee, I would hire you right now. And I was like, oh, my God, just my luck. And so so I took. we talked for about 30 minutes. He gave me his number and everything. I gave him mine. So I went home, and I never came back up. And he called me and said, hey, I'm starting Smoky Mountain. I want you to come work for me. But I didn't quit my job. I drove. I still did my – I still worked. And I drove to Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, did TVs for Cornette, drove all the way back home. Because I'd go up there on the weekends, right. drive all the way back home, no sleep, go back to work that work that week. And then Cornette was wanting me to quit my job, and I just I really didn't want, want to. And I, Cornette was one of my biggest advocates, and to this day I'm, I'm forever grateful to him yeah. because he was really pushing hard for me because he, I was going to be his guy because he was trying to make mold me and make me – because he was going to make me champion, his champ, Smoky Mountain heavyweight champion. And – the character that he wanted me to be, I was uncomfortable playing. So it's like doing these promos was really difficult what was for it? me. Just be like being a, like I'm a big movie star type guy. Huh. Like I, I I rubbed elbows with all the top movie stars in Hollywood, and and Bob, I'd always go Bob out to Hollywood. Hollywood. Yeah, it was right. yeah Bob Hollywood Holly, and so I just couldn't, you know, because when you're in the wrestling business, you and I know if you're not comfortable do, being a character, you're not gonna. Yeah. Put 100% into I it. I love the idea of you, you have with this accent saying, oh, I'm from Hollywood. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, yeah, y'all. Yeah, it's right. Me, Hollywood superstar. <laughs> yeah. So, and he he had all, uh, Cornette's not a patient man. Yeah. But let me tell you something. More. He had a lot of patience with me. I mean, he did. And a lot of people don't like him. I I really like Jim. You know, I, 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 I obviously, a lot of people know my past with him. I, I, I don't care for nowadays, Jim, maybe, but yeah. uh, I, what I do recognize is that he was back years ago, he was in this position where he was with the WWF and he was with uh, a WCW or NWA. And uh, 
he would see those young guys that I was like doing enhancement jobs, and he would see the potential in them yep. that I feel that the 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 bigger office didn't have time for to look and see. Yeah, and guys, you know, like you and Carino and the Headbangers, and there's a whole list of them. Yeah, that you know that he eventually said, "Hey, come to our my little thing and let me mold you." You know, and it's, and even the guys that he, I think he sent down, like like Chris Daniels, there's just a list of them. Yeah, and uh, it says something about him and it also says something about guys in a power position to make sure to always check out those young guys yeah. who bump well right and have a good look and yeah. like you can see the love that it'll be there in five or ten years you right. just have to put some time into and he, them. he's got such a passion for the business too and he fights for what he believes in he he really does I, i'm forever grateful to him he, we've had our times where we've screamed and yelled at each other and just went our separate ways and the next day is like nothing even happened. Mm. You know, I just I've I've always been grateful to him. I love him to death. Uh, there's not a I have not a bad word to say about him because he gave me an opportunity. And I, and I feel terrible that I didn't stick it out, which it ended up folding because I was scared to I was scared to quit my job again because right. I'd done already quit it twice. Real that's real life stuff, right? Right. There. Yeah. And and plus I wanted to get into racing and everything too, but and I think Jimmy kind of had a held a grudge held it against me because i didn't you know stick it out with smoky mountain mm -hmm. you know and it, it ended up folding too so i think i made the right decision but on the other hand he he was giving me a huge opportunity to really become something and and really really make something of myself too well listen man uh we we didn't i, I think there for another day maybe uh but there's plenty more we could talk yeah, about. yeah i really because the idea of of being that undercard guy and then, and then you know working your way through that whole system is very intriguing to me and and I like the story too. So I, I say you know one day we uh, we revisit this. I think so. Yeah, I'd like to I talk so. with you again on this. But this was great, man. I, yeah. I appreciate the. Oh, the talk. thank you. Yeah, I've I've always been. I've always from the first time I listened to your show. And this was a while back. This was before I got to talk to you in England. I've always wanted to be on your show because I, I love listening to you talk. I, I I find you very interesting. You have a lot of good um, points you make on things, issues that you bring up, and and points that you make. It's just I find it very intriguing, very interesting. I appreciate it, and my voice is soothing. And right? you have a very nice voice. Hollywood, I'm ready yes. for Hollywood. Yes, you are. Yes. Hollywood, cool yeah. 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 Thank uh, you so much, though. Yeah, really. I no, appreciate it. it. It's been a pleasure getting to know you these last uh, yep. year or so. And um, can I say one more thing? Because I, I know we're um, short on time, but uh, you can follow me at at. Uh, at the Bob Holly well, on Twitter, at, yeah, and I and and I will answer everybody and and for whoever's listening out there, Colt will tell you. I know you've seen. I, I answer get everybody. In, yeah, I get tagged in them. <laughs> I answer everybody. So I may not get to you right away, but I have answered everybody. And and you have a book out too. And I have a book, the Hardcore Truth Bob Holly Story, and I talk about that whole pretty much what we talked about the way I came up in the mm -hmm. business and, and things like that. But so. in, re in reading form. In reading form. And I talk form. about the whole infamous Matt Capitelli thing that would just still will not go away. It'll haunt you, man. It, it will. It'll it will. You. Well, if you want that juicy gossip, you got to buy the book. Right? That's right. Uh, I appreciate you being on. Yeah, thank you very much, Colt. Thank appreciate you. it. It's fun. Didn't even get to like the meat of the WWE stuff. I felt we could. That will be for another time if I ever see him. He's uh, out in the out in the woods a lot. He tells me he's just out in the woods, secluded from everyone. Pretty good life. Pretty good life. All right, before we get out of here, let's get into some plugs and upcoming events. All right, the best way you can support ColtMerch.com, DigitalColt.com. I got a Twitter and Instagram at Colt Cabana, Facebook slash AOW Podcast, and slash Colt Cabana. ColtWrestling at gmail.com is my very public email. Maybe you got something to say to me. Maybe you're a promoter want to put me on an upcoming show or convention. Hit me up. CutMyPromo.com. I got a YouTube channel, basically, slash Colt Cabana Wrestling. And ColtCabana.com is my website. Got a P.O. box. Send me something in the snail mail for when I come back. I like opening that kind of stuff. Upcoming through November 9th, I will be in Japan at noah.co.jp. Friday and Saturday, November 13th and 14th, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Queens, New York, houseofhardcore.net. Sunday, November 15th, Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Live Art of Wrestling at 2 o'clock. The show starts at 4 o'clock, alpha-1wrestling.com. Friday and Saturday, November 20th and 21st, Sayreville and Keyport, New Jersey. 
ProWrestlingSyndicate.com. Wednesday, November 25th, Marty and I are in Chicago. We're doing a show at the Cards Against Humanity headquarters. Those tickets are only available at ColtCabana.com. Saturday, November 28th, Winston-Salem, North Carolina, WrestleCade.com. Friday, December 4th, Chicago, Illinois, FreelanceWrestling.com. Doing a podcast before. Saturday, December 5th, Cleveland, Ohio, AIWrestling.com. Sunday, December 6th, Alton, Illinois, right outside St. Louis, PWCSWrestling.com. Those are the upcoming events. That is the Road Diaries 3. Funny equals money. This has been the show. We're done for the day. Back to the road. Back to the Japanese highways and byways. Big thank you to you at home for listening. I do appreciate it. Thanks to Bob Holly for coming on the show. Thanks to Kate. we got Jeff and Stu Stone. Kid Russell, Matt Jenkins on the music. Dane Miller with the tech. So thanks to some sponsors. Highspots.com. Hundreds of full-length titles available to download. They got a ring. They got gear. They got masks. They got a lot of content. DVDs, stuff with Meltzer and Heroes on there. Go check them out. OneHourTees.com, who helped run ProWrestlingTees.com. Stone Cold wore his new shirt on Raw. You could buy that. ProWrestlingTees.com. Or you can help the other little people you know the little people like stone cold there's other ones though that do need your help and support pro wrestling tees.com tweakedaudio.com slash cult the earbuds that i use get over 30 percent off and free shipping just because you listen to this show all right gone banwa i think i said that right you would think after i think it's almost 10 years i've been coming to japan that i would learn more japanese words but no because i'm an ignorant piece of shit and i realize it I, I, I mean, I realize it. So that's Harry uh, Harry Smith taught me how to say, are you single? Do you have a boyfriend? And uh, I already forgot it. I already forgot it. So pretty worthless when it comes to that. So let's just uh, shut it down. I'm going to edit this real quick and somehow get it out to you tomorrow. Who knows? All right. This has been The Art of Wrestling. For Cole Cabana, I'm Cole Cabana. Thanks.